start by um, thanking HDO on behalf of the whole um, Evolution team for giving us the opportunity of being here and uh, celebrate with you this, this very important milestone. Um, but also to share with you what we as a HD community have achieved in these 10 years and just thank you all uh, for what we have achieved thanks to your contribution and to everyone who participated in the group. So the first uh, uh, participant was uh, recruited on uh, uh, 25th of July 2012 uh, in Tennessee. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, this, that participant is still in the study. And I think that in itself speaks a lot about the dedication and, uh, um, and how committed this community is. So I think it's just, just such a nice part. So in this presentation, we'll go through um, really briefly about the main milestones of the role. Um, I'll share with you um, your achievement um, and what the uh, uh, what difference has uh, Evo has, um, has made in the uh, HDA research. Um, I'll share what we um, what is expected for us and what the future of Evo HD we look at. And then um, we wanted to share some testimonials that we gathered um, from HD uh, Evo HD participants. So Evo has started, as I said, uh, on the 25th of July 2012. Uh, already in four years, the study has grown exponentially, and uh, by 2016, we were already at 10,000 participants. It was a big celebration. Uh, everybody was like, wow. Um, in, uh, oh, let me try this. Yeah. So in, by 2019, the study was running in uh, 20 countries already in four um, continents. So we, as, as you may know, the uh, study is running in Latin America, Australasia, Europe, and North America. And then 10 years later, here we are celebrating the uh, uh anniversary. Before we, I go into the detail, actually, uh, I don't know if, and, uh, if all of you know what a role is. Just really briefly, is uh, a clinical research platform and an observational study for HD. Families. Uh, if uh, I don't have time to go much in details uh, on this presentation, so the presentation is made about uh, sharing and celebrating. Uh, but if you do have any questions, we have an innovation table just outside here. We have uh, it's about ten of us in the team, so maybe you can uh, raise your hand. We have several, several languages. Uh, we have Norwegian, uh, Danish, uh, Polish, Spanish, Italian. So. Please come and, uh, and talk to us if you have any questions on the or any question that may arise during the, uh, uh, during the presentation or the discussion. So just to give you some metrics uh, um, to show you how um, big a role is and the width and the rich, richness of, of the role. As of 1st of January, we had uh, recruited almost 29,000. I checked this morning and I was hoping that we would get to 30,000 by, uh, uh, by today, but it's, uh, it's 29,400. So we're getting there close to the 30,000, which I think is really nice. So as of 1st of January, not almost 95,000 visits were conducted and uh, 66 million data points collected. Um, the study is running in 156 uh, sites in 23 nations, so we have expanded in three more nations since uh, 2019. And uh, the number of studies and trials that have been supported by EuroHD in many different ways, and uh, I would uh, invite you to go to the website that's uh, over there is a lot of information on how, in general, EuroHD is uh, supporting research. Um, it's uh, 23 uh, trials and, uh, and studies. And then there's over 110 uh, publications published with the role HD samples and data. Okay, so um, many of you may know that the uh, role was established with three main objectives. Uh, the first one is uh, supporting clinical trials and studies. Uh, the second one is uh, enhancing the understanding of the disease. And the third one is uh, um, improving clinical care. Um, so, and Again, I want to thank you because uh, thanks to uh, everyone that contributed to Red Bull, um, we have been able to meet and we are actually continuing to meet. So it's a continuing improvement uh, uh, to meet the three objectives. Uh, just really briefly, how we are meeting these objectives so in terms of supporting clinical trials. Uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a very, it's a, com a community that is very committed to HD research. So uh, we have seen that about 50% uh, of the participants that participated in uh, current trials or trials that have been recently completed were participants of uh, uh, Aerol HD. And uh, again, the, the contribution and the, uh, the fact that you um, 
participate in the study that really give a big push and a big support to these trials. It would have been completely different if you um, without your participation. So, uh, in terms of enhancing the understanding of geo, obviously there's a big focus on clinical trials for obvious reasons. However, in these ten years there have been some very remarkable uh, breakthroughs um, that were really possible thanks to the uh, uh, data and samples collected in, in the role. And I'm just going to mention some of them, but we could list many, many, many more. Um, one important discovery was the uh, discovery of the, uh, the um, genetic modifiers that were discovered by the GWAS group on uh, the modifiers of disease onset. <laughs> Uh, the uh, role HD uh, samples have allowed the uh, development of uh, the SA for measuring the, uh, the Huntington. Um, the, uh, you may have heard of the new staging system that is used in, uh, um, in, uh, for research purposes, the HDISS was also uh, developed through, uh, um, through the aborted uh, samples. So, this is just to give you some examples, but uh, your, your data and your samples have really contributed to kind of give a big push to, uh, um, to uh, research in HD. And then last but not least, um, a role has helped in improving clinical care. And that's actually, so as part of this celebration, we visited several sites. And so we got the perspective also from the clinicians that were involved in a role. And uh, this is a feedback that we heard quite often that um, a role gives an opportunity of uh, um, being provide a certain continuity because uh, um, the study requires the uh, participant to come back on the, for their annual visit year after year. So the fact that they are coming back to the sites uh, and they are followed on year after year just just provide that continuity, just that opportunity to see how they are doing, uh, whether there have been any changes. And even the clinician themselves, they look at the um, the role uh, data from the previous years. Uh, for that specific participant that is coming to the clinic visit and they use that data to see how, uh, how they were doing the previous year. So that kind of continuity um, is, is quite important in terms of supporting clinical care. The other important aspect is that all the participants are followed uh, every year in the same way in all the 156 uh, sites. So having a standardized battery of assessment that also helps um, from a clinical, uh, clinical care perspective. And last but not least, there is a big focus on the training. So um, all the waiters are, uh, they are conducting a role, um, are trained on the assessment. We have a couple of uh, uh, certifications. Um, so the, so all, all, all together, all of this is uh, kind of creating a, a, an expertise and a, and a culture of excellence at the, at the clinical side. So, uh, it's uh, it's happening also from from the clinical care perspective. So now, when young people fit in all of this, uh, um, so young people are actually crucial, absolutely crucial. So we have seen what we had. Uh, I just mentioned a couple of uh, things that um, the HD research community have discovered. However, and we do know that uh, changes do happen before most of us set, but there's still um, a lot of work to be discovered. And that uh, age range of the young participants, so I, I put here on the slide, um, this is a graph of the uh, age of the participants uh, when they enter, when they had the first baseline. So it's, it's the first, uh, so the second and third bar is the age range between 18, 18 to 35. And this is really the cohort that we would like to see um, uh, participating in the study. So you can see it's considerably less uh, compared to the 36 and over. So we are really um, encouraging, whatever, if you can, to take part in the study because your contribution, especially from, your, uh, from the young people, is absolutely crucial um, to the success of the study and to the success of HD uh, research in general. Uh, well, so what does the future uh, look like? So we, one nice thing that we have, I think that everyone working in a role or, or participating in a role or being involved in a role somehow is this very nice feeling of community. I, I personally feel it very much and it's something that is very present. Uh, so we, we are hoping to continue building on that uh, community. 
thing. So how can you, uh, how can that happen? So in terms of clinical trial readiness, so allowing, enabling the science, support, uh, helping the science in conducting clinical trials, um, as I said, it's, uh, uh, it's really, really important. Uh, it would be very, um, it would really help speed up research if you would uh, uh, participate in the study. And, uh, and again, uh, the fact that you, um, if you have already enrolled in the study, it's very important that you provide year to year your data and sample. The biosap is actually an, an optional component. So if you don't feel like collecting sample, that's absolutely fine. Um, we will talk about it later. There is just one sample that you, you're requested to donate. Um, but if you're feeling like donating biosamples, that's something that really contributes to research. So I just wanted to mention it. And we are also looking at changing the protocol, the study protocol, to make it a bit, there's several changes and it's still under development. Some of the changes that we are implementing is the implementation of the new staging system that I mentioned earlier on. And the, we are switching the, um, we are changing the assessment so that we have a battery of assessment that is more tailored for uh, each uh, specific uh, disease stage. So we will have groups of different assessment based on the different disease stages. But as I say, uh, it's still under development. And uh, so when we were presenting, uh, when we were preparing for the AHD celebration, there was a lot of discussion about what we should do, what we should be looking at. And something that was very important for, for us as a, as a team, as, as the AHD team, was uh, how is, what does the role mean to, to the participants? So we, um, through different associations and, uh, uh, and the science as well, we collected some uh, messages. And I, I'm just going to leave them there for you to read, but I think something really as I came out is that um, many of the responses that we get is that participating in the group uh, make them feel that they are providing a contribution uh, to the whole community and to HD research and, uh, and then the kind of sense of hope that would come from their participation is something that came out quite, uh, quite frequently in the messages. So. Uh, yeah, so Tim, for instance, says that uh, HD has improved my outlook on HD and improved my outlook on the prospective uh, prospect of uh, uh, effective therapeutics. And uh, it's an easy way to feel that you are contributing in some ways, not just by adding data. So um, Robert really says it is. So it's, it is. It is a collection of different samples, but the ultimate uh, contribution is just something uh, really uh, priceless. And uh, I just want to leave it. Leave you with the. Uh, message that uh, Robert says that everyone who can should be part of a community. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you not only for listening, but again, um, and I share this on behalf of the, uh, the whole evolution team that is here, everyone is everyone uh, back home. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you have done. Everything that I've shown is just thanks to your dedication, contribution, the time that you put um, into, uh, into the study. So a big um, heartfelt uh, thank you. You're really, really great. Hi, everybody. How's everybody feeling? Probably better than me. Um, <laughs> Just before we get started, um, I thought it'd be a good idea to get a feel for if anybody heard about Enroll HD before today. So if you've heard about Enroll HD today, can you please raise your hands? That is excellent. Um, have any of you taken part in Enroll HD? Amazing. Can we get a big hand? Right. Well, and this is not to make anybody feel bad for not taking part, it's just to get an idea for what we're working with. Um, <laughs> so, do you want to maybe introduce yeah. just yourselves? Yeah. Um, everybody knows Seth, right? Uh, yeah. Seth has uh, been with HGO as an advocate. <laughs> and Selene, what is your role in HD or in role HD? Um, so, I'm the global uh, study director for the study, mm -hmm. and I'm part of the uh, ESGN, um, mm -hmm. of ESGN, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is Olivia Handley. Hello, yeah, I am the platform director for Enroll HD and also part of EHDN. And I'm Lauren Byrne. Um, <laughs> I am I'm on the board for HDO and I'm a HD researcher and family member um, who's taken part in Enroll HD for many years now. Um, and I think Seth has as well. So, 
do you have any questions to get us started, Seth? Sure. So I would say first question is, um, I think the big thing is, do I need to be tested if I want to participate in enroll? Mm -hmm. And it's a two-part question. All right, you ready? 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 So do I need to be tested? And if not, will I know my gene status if I go through enroll? So yeah, thanks very much for the uh, question because there is a bit of a uh, misconception or perhaps misunderstanding on that. So the short answer to the first part of your question, do I need to be tested? No, you absolutely don't need to be tested. If you, uh, so if a person has gone through uh, genetic testing, we do collect the data in the database. So we have a local genetic test um, results. However, um, anybody from an HD family can participate and if you have not been tested, everyone is asked to donate their blood sample that was mentioned earlier on, for the determination of the, uh, it's called research CAG. So that is a, a CAG that is a, a result that is determined by a central lab. And is not, I want to highlight that it's not for diagnostic purposes. Uh, and the other thing that is important to that kind of answer your question is that nobody, um, so the result of that research CAG is not shared, is not shared with the site, is not shared with us, is not shared with um, the operational team working in the team, and most of it is not shared with the participant. Even, so that research CAG, what that does allow is uh, to reclassify the participant for research purposes into carrier and non-carrier. Um, however, even the researchers, when they get given the, uh, res the, the data, when they're requesting the data, um, they cannot, there's a whole series of measures that I'm not going to explain. If you're interested, uh, please come to us and we'll be more than happy to explain. But there's a whole series of uh, measures that are implemented to make sure that uh, um, the researchers cannot trace back their result to a specific uh, uh, individual. So. That's something really important. Thanks for asking because it's a, it's a very important question. So you don't need to be tested and you will not find out your genetic status. That is really paramount and it's, 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 it's very important. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a whole series of measures that are implemented to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I would add you can also be gene negative. I'm a gene negative control. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, family controls as well can, can be a part of it. So yeah. Um, is my data safe? Your data are safe. So the way in which it works is that everybody who consents to take part in Enroll HD, they agree to having what we call an HDID created. So we take um, specific in, um, in identifying information about you, so your name, your first name, your last name, your date of birth, your mother's maiden name, and we put that into an algorithm, and it's a one-way algorithm, very much how a credit card generates the long number string associated with you, and that gives us a nine-digit code. That nine-digit code is the only thing that we record on our EDC, so we don't put your name into the system. Um, and once we've created that code, the algorithm or the tool that we use doesn't save your identifying information. We don't store that information. The way in which we um, keep the data is through an electronic data capture system, so an online database. We have very strict measures in place to make sure that we safeguard exactly who can access that. So these are the study sites, the clinicians, the study support team who have been given specific restricted access to enter the database through a password protected system. When they go into that system, they take your HDID and they will create, um, if you like, an online file that captures your annual visits. So that's where we include the data about perhaps um, so, uh, any conditions that you may have, the results from the assessments, questionnaires, um, biosample, the blood collections. And we go back to that same file year on year and keep adding visits to it. That's one side of how we treat the data. The other side is sharing the data, because obviously we want to build the database so that we can share it with the community and really get the maximum output from it. And that means that we take the data from that database and we put it through very rigorous measures to make sure that it is almost impossible to identify anybody from the data set. That means that we take that HDID and we put it through another algorithm to generate another nine-digit code. So it's introducing another step 
from whatever we had in place before. So it's even safer. And then when we take the data set and we're putting all of that information, we then put additional measures in place. We've got some really brilliant biostatisticians that take a look at it, kind of scratch their heads and say, is there anything in this that means there is a risk of potentially identifying someone? So if you take the example of perhaps we've got a participant who is 110 years old, if we look at that person, that's probably quite identifying that we know there's probably only one person in the study that's that age. What we do with that is we aggregate those sorts of values. So we would say, we're going to put everybody who's aged 90 and above in a category. We're not going to include their individual age, because in that case, it's too identifying. So we put measures like that in place. We also can remove specific information that we just think it's too risky. Um, so yeah, I would say the data are safe. We handle them responsibly, but we really want to make sure that we get the data out there to people to use. Sounds like you guys have some good data folks over there. <laughs> so many young people here, including myself, may either work full time or be a, a, a current student. So could you maybe talk about quickly the, the time commitment? Uh, how many time, how many visits per year? About, I know it varies, but about how long each visit entails? <laughs> Okay, so it's uh, one is the baseline visit um, that uh, would entail the assessments and uh, uh, the blood collection, and then it's an annual visit. There is a window of plus or minus three months um, that uh, is allowed, and then if for whatever reason the participant cannot go within that plus or minus three months, it is not the end of the world. But that. Uh, that is the indication. Uh, in terms of uh, how long the assessments will last, so the, the way that the protocol is structured, there are some core assessments that are carried out um, to all the participants. They're sort of mandatory, so to say. Um, so we estimate for that uh, to take about 45 minutes. Uh, and then there is a series of um, extended assessment that uh, uh, the uh, the site may elect to do, or the participant may, uh, if the site is, is elected to do it, the participant, and the participant agrees. Uh, and then, so we estimate that uh, if you do it all, we estimate a maximum, maximum of two hours and 25 minutes. I, I'm not aware of, I mean, there may be sites that do it. Uh, it's quite challenging, I suppose, for a site, but that's the maximum. So uh, we say that it goes from 45 minutes to two hours and 25 minutes. Did you want to add anything? No, I think it's Maybe you can uh, share about uh, the importance of giving blood and how that helps with research. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you, Seth. So um, we ask, as Selena explained, every participant is asked to give a, a small, like a single test tube of blood to determine that research CAG value. And that is what that specific blood sample is used for. On the informed consent, we also have what we call an optional component where people can additionally agree to donate up to another 30 milliliters of blood, so that's another three test tubes of blood. And that blood is used specifically to look at whether there are genetic modifiers and whether there are biomarkers um, in products that we can derive from the blood. And for that, it's a numbers game. We need lots and lots of samples to be able to get some of those answers. Um, and I think, as Selena mentioned, one of the significant achievements that simply wouldn't have been possible without having large volumes of participants donating blood samples was the genetic modifier results. Um, and I think work is still ongoing, obviously, to try and identify more biomarkers and um, more genetic modifiers. So I think that's a really, really valuable component of the study if people are happy to donate the blood. I don't know if you guys can answer this question, but I thought it would be important to discuss and maybe Seth can have more of a comment on it. Um, I think a lot of maybe this demographic who are at risk or gene positive have a lot of anxieties about taking part in research. Um, so I, I think this is more maybe one for sighted based level or people who are actually interacting with, with the patients and doing the research. Um, will they find out they've got symptoms or will they be told that, that they've got movements of HD or things like that? Um, I guess this is something you might not be able to um, 
really answer, but I think it's an important thing to discuss about taking part in research. Do you want to take that on? I think, um, so it's, it is a really important question. I think a lot of these um, sites are existing HD clinical centres um, and they are there in a capacity of clinical care as well. Um, many of the assessments that they're doing in Enrol HD might also be assessments that they're doing clinically anyway. Um, and I think there is perhaps a duty from those clinical sites, perhaps with their sort of care hats on, to think about, I need to be able to answer any of the questions questions or anxieties that people may have. Um, one of the things that quite often elicits um, kind of nervousness is cognitive testing. So I used to do um, neuropsychology tests at the clin a clinic in Cardiff. Um, and, you know, people are very um, aware of when perhaps they get something wrong or they've skipped an answer and it's very easy to quickly read into what that might mean. Is this the start? Is this what's happened? Um, and so I think, um, for me, at least in those settings, I would sort of say, that we're in a, a, a sort of a very artificial environment in a way. We're, we're sort of sitting down in a paper and pencil test. And in isolation, that test may not really mean anything. It's about looking at the pattern over time. And so you wouldn't really want someone to walk out of a test situation um, for Enrol HD and maybe reading too much into it. But equally, I think there should be support within the site to address their questions and concerns. All right. Well, Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but what I will say is that if you're interested in learning more or have any questions, they do have a booth out there, uh, especially if you're interested in getting involved, signing up, uh, they can walk you through it, or you can go to uh, their website, or you can use uh, our lovely friend Google and search for it as well. So just wanted to say thank you to the two of you and for everyone who's participated or who will hopefully sign up by uh, the end of Congress. <laughs>